NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huang shares nine predictions for the future of AI. Over the last couple of years, NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huang has become an extremely notable figure. In the business and startup world, he's basically a one-name founder. But in the halls of power in Washington and Beijing, he has taken on an even more important significance. NVIDIA's AI chips are not only at the very center of the AI revolution, they are also at the center of the most important geostrategic relationship and conflict of our time, which is, of course, the constantly shifting relationship between the United States and China. Jensen is one of the few CEOs who actually bridges that gap, with this week being a perfect example. At the beginning of the week, he attended meetings with Chinese leaders and then immediately flew back to Washington to play a central role in the Trump administration's week-long event about winning the AI race. Now, there was lots of Jensen speaking this week. There's frankly, at this point, always a lot of Jensen speaking. But one event was a conversation with the folks from the All In podcast. They spoke with a handful of leaders, including AMD CEO Lisa Su, as well as several figures from the administration. The conversation with Jensen was definitely the most interesting, however, because whereas everyone else was focused on the topic du jour, which was what is needed in the next few years to cement the U.S. as the undisputed leader in AI, Jensen instead zoomed way out to the long-term trends. Prediction one. Jensen said AI will create more millionaires in five years than the internet did in 20. So obviously one of the big topics of conversation was Mark Zuckerberg's recent poaching spree. Co-host and former Meta employee Chamath Palahapatiya remarked that these huge contracts were happening exclusively at the model research layer, but don't seem to be happening at the hardware layer. Now, a couple things to note about this. First of all, it seems pretty clear to me that the reason that Zuckerberg is paying so much for these people is not just their outsized talent. It's the fact that they basically have IP in their heads. When you reframe it to think about basically taking all of OpenAI's IP, then paying $3 billion or whatever it ends up being for access to $300 billion worth of IP or whatever OpenAI's most recent valuation is, looks a little less crazy. Still, Jensen, however, wanted you to know that his people are doing just fine. He said, I've created more billionaires on my management team than any CEO in the world. Don't feel sad for anybody at my layer. My layer's doing just fine. More broadly, though, that's where he got into this wave of wealth creation, which he says is going to be more rapid than any other event we've ever seen. And building on that point about wealth creation, prediction number two, Jensen believes we're starting to transition to an era where elite human labor will be valued in a similar way to premium capital goods. The big idea, he said, is that the impact of 150 or so AI researchers can probably create, with enough funding behind them, create an open AI. Chamath was shocked by that number, but Jensen reinforced that DeepSeek is 150 people. Moonshot, the creators of Kimmy, which has gotten a ton of buzz, are 150 people. Basically, that the actual number of researchers creating this technology is vanishingly small. And frankly, Jensen pointed out that until Zuckerberg realized it earlier this year, no one had really done the math on how much these people are worth. Jensen commented, If you're willing to pay, say, $20 billion, $30 billion to buy a startup with 150 researchers, why wouldn't you pay one? Prediction number three is basically about jobs. And rather than worrying about AI disrupting jobs, Jensen is more concerned about not being able to create jobs fast enough to keep up. He commented that 100% of his workers use AI and the company is busier than ever. Not only are there zero layoffs, they can't keep up with their own possibilities. Now, obviously, NVIDIA is a bit of a special case. But I think that if every CEO emulated the way that Jensen was thinking about AI, it would lead to some better results. You've heard me squawk on endlessly here about efficiency AI versus opportunity AI, and it's very clear that Jensen is living in the opportunity side. He said, we have so many ideas that we want to go and pursue. AI makes it possible for us to go and pursue those ideas now that we're not doing the mundane stuff. This idea of not doing the mundane stuff is still a type of framing we use, but I really think it's even more fundamental than that, especially as agent capabilities increase and we get better at managing teams of agents that can work together to do increasingly more complex work. The benefit won't just be that we have more time to do higher order work. It'll be that we have incredible amounts of intelligence that we can deploy on our own behalf to do that work. In other words, it's not just what we can do with the freed up time based on AI taking on the boring stuff. It's what we can do with that time with armies of AI and agents backing us up. A fourth big idea or prediction about AI from Jensen was around how AI changes capabilities, specifically with programming. Jensen called AI the greatest technology equalizer of all time. Now, of course, the internet was the big equalizer when it came to geography. A company selling books out of Washington state could have the same distribution power as a company with hundreds of locations in major cities across the U.S. Jensen is articulating that AI could have the same effect for skills. He said, everybody's a programmer now. You used to have to know C, then C++, and then Python. Even if you don't know how to program an AI, just go up to the AI and ask, how do I program an AI? It's a great equalizer. Everybody is going to be augmented by it. 
Now, one interesting example of this was with the Norway Sovereign Wealth Fund we talked about recently, where half of their team was now coding thanks to AI tools. Prediction five, taking it a step further, it's not just that everyone is a programmer now. Jensen continued, everybody's an artist now. Everybody's an author now. Now, this obviously is deserving of some nuance. As AI normalizes and equalizes certain types of productive outputs across lots of different skill sets, we will reset the gradients of what high skill means, even if that high skill takes into account how well you use AI. But the point that Jensen is making is that everyone's productive capability is going way, way up. That on average, we will be able to produce much, much more each individually than anyone could have produced in the past. Jensen reinforced the point that the flip side of this is that everything is changing. He said everybody's jobs will be different, many jobs will be obsolete, but many jobs will be created. Now, as we know, none of this, of course, speaks to the difficulty of transition. One of the things that I harp on and I will continue to is that it is completely coherent and non-mutually exclusive to be extremely excited and optimistic about the future of a world with greater capability, greater capacity, new jobs, more outputs, and yet still be concerned about the process of creative destruction and upheaval that will absolutely happen and impact individual people in the transition period. Ultimately, that's not what Jensen was talking about, but I never want to brush past that and live entirely in the land of future utopia. Moving back to the technical a little bit, a sixth prediction is Jensen's concept of twin factories. Now, Jensen first unveiled this concept at NVIDIA's GTC event in March, but the idea was still fairly narrow. He talked about the need to create two factories for manufacturing work, a physical one that does the actual production, and then a digital twin that does all the prototyping and simulation of physical processes. In March, Jensen's big idea was that you can now use AI simulation to train robots, test production lines, and troubleshoot problems, all the tasks that could previously shut down a factory at great expense. Now Jensen's expanding that concept to everything, stating, everything that moves will be autonomous. Every company in the future will have two factories. There's the machine factory that creates a product, for example. Then there's the AI factory to create the AI for the cars. The future of industry is really two factories. And it's not just industry either. Jensen suggested that even things like air traffic control might one day be a human workforce overseeing a giant AI. He commented, In the future, every industrial company is going to be an AI company, or you're not going to be an industrial company. Prediction number seven was for all of the folks on Wall Street who are concerned about overspending on CapEx. And I guess it follows from the fact that Jensen is predicting that every company will be an AI company. But he suggests that right now, despite how much money has been spent, we're actually only a few hundred billion dollars into what will be a multi-trillion dollar build-out. Now, holding aside limits around energy and infrastructure capacity, which of course is a lot of what the White House's AI action plan was all about, fundamentally Jensen's concept is that the demand for AI is orders of magnitude larger than most people assume. There are still many people who are thinking about AI as an additional computer program that folds into the current ecosystem. Jensen, however, views this as a fundamental revolution in tech, and really, in many ways, the first one we've seen in decades. The big pull quote here, he said, we are reinventing computing for the first time in 60 years. This is a very big deal. Prediction 8 is around the same themes, and basically it's that we are about to see a huge infrastructure gold rush. Jensen said, In Arizona and Texas, we're probably going to produce half a trillion dollars worth of AI supercomputers, and that's probably going to drive a few trillion dollars worth of AI industry. And that's only over the next several years. And the point that he was making is not just that this is good for investors or for the AI industry, but that this fundamentally changes the shape of the U.S. economy and the economic strategy of the nation. Speaking to economic theory and protectionism, Jensen commented, people always degrade down to tennis shoes. We don't have to go there, we'll just manufacture chips and supercomputers. Basically what Jensen is saying is that if the spectrum of options is throw up walls on the one end and outcompete on the other, he is very firmly in the outcompete column. Number nine, pulling it all together, Jensen made the case for why the American tech stack needs to be at the center of this. He remarked, could you imagine if DeepSeek came out and it only worked on the non-American tech stack? Could you imagine if the same was true for Quen or Kimi? These are the top three open models in the world today, downloaded hundreds of millions of times. So the fact of the matter is, the American tech stack being the world standard is vital to the future of winning the AI race. Any computing platform wins because of developers. Half of the world's AI developers are in China. Now, in some ways, this was one of the more clear articulations that we've heard from Jensen on why he's wanted to push NVIDIA chips back into China. Outside, of course, obviously, the money and his fiduciary responsibility to his shareholders. But the point that he was making, or at least the subtext of it, was that NVIDIA got to the top of the stack in AI chip making by being early, 
but they retained their lead and expanded their lead through the CUDA programming platform. AI models developed to run on NVIDIA systems run into compatibility issues on other systems. There's workarounds, but CUDA has been an incredible moat for NVIDIA. The extrapolation is that it feels like Jensen's biggest fear isn't that China's Huawei develops a capable chip, but instead that they create a developer ecosystem to rival NVIDIA. I think he's applying that thinking now or expanding that thinking to all of the U.S., that the AI race isn't just about developing the leading model, but about securing the devotion of the developers who build on it. Really interesting stuff. It is always fascinating to hear Jensen speak, especially capstoning a week where this was the big theme throughout Washington, D.C. For now, that is going to do it for today's AI Daily Brief. Appreciate you listening or watching, as always. And until next time, peace.